Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Friday, everybody. I hope you're having a productive last work day of the year. It's the end of the year, so there have been a lot of reports and numbers being published this week. This is why the last few days have been very economy and finance heavy videos. Today's will be similar, and tomorrow we will look back over 2023 for a year in review. According to the data, according to data from the China International Capital Corporation, rates of China's larger regional banks taking over their smaller peers has gathered pace in recent months. This month alone has already seen five bank mergers and acquisitions. In comparison, there were only 22 mergers and acquisitions and restructurings involving small and mid-sized banks between January 2020 and this May, and just seven before 2020. Chinese financial media outlet Yitai, reporting on the development, writes that the mergers and acquisitions approved in December were of two types. In the first type, a new bank was set up to absorb and consolidate the party's assets, with the creditors' rights and liability all undertaken by the newly established bank before the merger. In the second type, a larger bank directly absorbed a smaller one through a cash deal or by buying a controlling stake, with the assimilated lender becoming a unit of the buyer. Luo Zhihang, chief economist at Yue Kai Securities, explains that the faster pace of mergers and acquisitions is aimed to, at solving the financial risks these smaller regional lenders have built up over recent years. Quote, A key focus during the merger process should be on the better handling of non-performing assets. End quote. Yitai writes that the high number of smaller lenders and the relatively higher risk involved with them is one of the distinctive characteristics of China's banking industry. Quote, In fact, 90% of all domestic banks were small and medium-sized lenders as of June 30th, while their assets accounted for less than 30% of the total. End quote. In the second quarter of this year, 337 banks were deemed high risk by regulators, with 323 or 96% small or micro lenders. For now, we just take note of this development. Next up for the economy. Yesterday, Thursday, Beijing completed its last land auction of 2023, quote, capping a year of declining prices, showing that even the most resilient property market is struggling to attract developers to buy land amid a prolonged real estate slump. End quote. In the words of Chinese financial media outlet Tai Sin, in 2023, Beijing sold 5.82 million square meters of land for residential development, up 7.8 percent from last year. But this was because 2022, a zero COVID year, had a very low base. The sales are well below pre-2019 levels. The China Index Academy points out average prices fell by 7.1 percent to a little above 30,000 yuan a square meter. Beijing conducted 27 auctions this year, compared with just five in 2022, and Beijing's performance was one of the best in the country, according to market research firm China Real Estate Information Corp. Among the first tier cities, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen, all sold less this year than in 2022. Even with the base effect, the land auction areas plunged 30%, 40%, and more than 70%, respectively. Tsai Xin notes that land auction area in second and third tier cities fell nearly 20% year on year. Nationwide, 300 cities sold a total of 1.22 billion square meters of land for 3.75 trillion yuan, the lowest level in a decade, and down 21% and 18% year on year. Respectively, as we discussed yesterday, the consensus among global banks and other financial institutions is that China's housing investment will continue to see moderate contraction as we move into next year. Next up, last week we discussed the talks between top Chinese and American military leaders, the first formal ones of their kind since they were discontinued by Beijing in response to the Pelosi talks last year. We covered the U.S. coverage of them last week. Now the official PRC response has been published, which we can quickly cover now. Yesterday, Thursday, a People's Liberation Army spokesman called the restored high-level dialogue between the two militaries "quote positive and constructive" end quote, exchanging "quote candid and in-depth views" end quote, but hit out at the U.S. for "quote treating China as a military threat." 
end quote. The spokesman added, quote, We expect the U.S. side to walk with us towards the same goal and take concrete actions on the basis of equality and mutual respect to promote a sound and steady development of the U.S.-China military-to-military relationship, end quote. Hong Kong-based South China Morning Post reporting on the press event reports today that at the same press event briefing, the spokesman also protested against the U.S. National Defense Administration Authorization Act for the fiscal year of 2024, which proposes greater military aid for Taiwan and includes a series of measures aimed at countering the mainland's military influence in the Indo-Pacific. Biden signed off on the act, which increased the U.S. defense budget and authorized more spending on intelligence, national security programs, and foreign relations last Friday. The spokesman, reports the South China Morning Post, said that the Chinese military, quote, firmly opposed the act, end quote, and said it, quote, makes groundless hype about the so-called Chinese military threat, grossly interferes in China's internal affairs, and severely harms China's national sovereignty, security, and development interests. End quote. Taiwan promises to be an acute flashpoint in 2024, one which we will be following very closely. Next up, record-breaking capital flight. I hope you're enjoying today's episode. If you're getting some value from this episode, I only have one ask. That is to like and subscribe. This is the primary way in which this channel grows. The main way it is shown to new people is if the algorithm is happy. For anyone who wants to help keep the channel financially sustainable, which allows me to continue doing this every day, open and free for all, Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are in the description below. My commitment has been a channel open to all that is reliant primarily on subscriber support rather than corporate sponsorship. And with your assistance, I know I can keep it that way. Thank you so much, everybody for the ongoing support. Next up, an update on a space which we've been following very closely this year, the collapse in foreign capital. According to UK-based Financial Times calculations published today, based on data from Hong Kong's Stock Connect trading scheme, nearly 90% of the foreign money that flowed into China's stock market in 2023 has already left. Quote, spurred by mounting doubts about Beijing's willingness to take serious action to boost flagging growth. End quote. Since peaking at 235 billion RMB, 33 billion US dollars in August, net foreign investment in China listed shares this year has dropped 87% to just 30.7 billion yuan. The Financial Times explains that traders and analysts say the reversal reflected pessimism over the outlook for China's economy among global fund managers. International investors have been persistent net sellers since August when missed bond payments by developer Country Garden revealed the severity of a liquidity crisis in the country's property sector. Quote, The confidence issue goes beyond real estate, although real estate is key. I'm referring to consumer confidence, business confidence, and investor confidence, both from domestic and foreign investors. End quote. The CSI 300 benchmark has lost 12% so far this year, among the world's worst-performing major indexes, and poised for a third annual decline. The CSI 300 is set to close out the year, down more than 15% in dollar terms. After a promising Q2, global investor perceptions of Chinese equities deteriorated substantially in the second half of this year, as pledges of policy support in July were quickly followed by mispayments at Country Garden and other cash-trapped developers. Net foreign sales of China-listed shares have reached about 26 billion yuan in December, and overseas investors are set to record their smallest ever annual purchases of Chinese stocks. Foreign funds bought just 44 billion yuan, 6.1 billion US dollars, of onshore stocks via trading links with Hong Kong on a net basis so far in 2023. U.S.-based Bloomberg reports today that overseas funds are set to flee Chinese stocks for the fifth month in December, an unprecedented streak. Quote, It's so counterintuitive. The data is getting better and the general environment should be quite positive for Chinese stocks. Frankly, there's no reason for this other than investors basically giving up and saying, we don't see the upside. End quote. More optimistic voices argue that the end of depreciation pressure for the yuan may drive some overseas investors back into China, though this position was undermined last Friday when Beijing once again spooked markets with more unexpected crackdown-looking rules for the technology and gaming sectors. Quote, The question I get from clients about Chinese equities is, which sectors? But when they push me, I don't know what to tell them. 
because there is no sector. End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Have a good Friday. I hope you've had a productive year. I hope you have a good weekend ahead. And I will see you for this year's last episode of China Update tomorrow.